Straight out of Philly, this is the Reluctant Theologian Podcast. I am your host, Dr. R.T. Mullins from the University of Lucerne. In today's episode, I sit down with Dr. Kevin Vallier to discuss his new book, All the Kingdoms of the World. This is a full-scale investigation into a theological and political movement called Catholic Integralism. At the moment, you can order the book through Kevin's website at a discount. The website is kevinvallier.com. I'm going to have a link for you in the show notes. If you'd like to support the show, you can donate money to my Patreon account or my coffee account. Any donation amount helps me out in so many ways. I greatly appreciate all the support that people have already offered. If you have questions or topics that you'd like to hear in the show, you can send me a message at rtmullins.com. Well, ready or not, here's Kevin and I chatting about politics. Enjoy. So in today's episode, we are going to get way more political than I usually go. I mean, yes, I know I've had both Donald Trump and Joe Biden on the show before, but today we're going to have a serious political discussion. I have with me Kevin Vallier. So Kevin, you have a new book out called All the Kingdoms of the World on Radical Religious Alternatives to Liberalism. So this book is it's about this movement called Catholic Integralism. And so I want to get into a lot of these different issues today, but before we do that, we got to define some terms. Otherwise, no one's going to know what we're talking about. So like, what on earth is liberalism? And then like, what is Catholic integralism? Like, what are these two different views? Great. So um, first, thanks for having me on the show. I've been a fan for uh, a long time and bringing up the book. You know, All the Kingdoms of the World is about integralism, but it's also, in looking at integralism, extends to analysis of similar doctrines in other religions. But since it's focused on integralism, let's focus on integralism. First, liberalism, in my mind, you know, can be used as an ideology, a you know, philosophical doctrine, a doctrine about your know, personal life or what have you, but about theology. But when I use the term liberalism, I'm thinking about a political tradition, something that manifests in philosophical thought, that manifests in, say, political parties, and that sort of generally in the culture. It's fundamentally about the values that should structure government and what government does. So it's not a series of values about living your own personal life. It's not what Rawls called a comprehensive doctrine. It doesn't cover all points of life. It's restricted to the use of government power. And it says that in general, there's kind of four principles by which it should be structured. And these are principles. They're all, I think, in most liberals, but there's so much diversity in the liberal tradition that these core principles are understood differently. Mm -hmm. But the very first uh, at the heart of it is this sort of doctrine of individual liberty and the liberty of small groups. Freedom for interference from the state. There are other kinds of, say, more positive liberty, freedom to be able to act from one's own reason. They may include welfare rights or liberties, say, from fear or liberty from hunger. Um, But in general, the liberal tradition is focused on the protection of liberty. Now, there are different reasons that it does that, um, but that's principle one. Principle two is equality. So the idea here is sometimes the doctrine is pretty weak. It says we should eliminate all kind of societal restrictions that create natural hierarchies. So if you think about in the Constitution, our Constitution, the federal government um, can't award any titles of nobility, right? So like that would just be a, a very basic liberal principle. It's like do not have rule by aristocracy. You should either have rule, you know, by merit or by use of opportunities. So liberalism is kind of opposed to sort of aristocracy. It's opposed to unearned or un, an unchosen hierarchy. So equality in that very basic sense, people have equal rights. Sometimes the notion of equality gets a little bit thicker. They require things like income equality, mm-hmm. um, but that principle of equality is there. The third principle of liberalism is toleration. It starts with religion, and it says generally people should be able to sort of pursue and practice the religion of their choosing. Um, but more recent liberals have extended this to cover secular doctrines uh, and moral doctrines in general, since so the state should not really take sides when it comes to broader moral doctrines and not just on, on religious doctrines. The tradition, liberal tradition is, is neutrality in matters of faith, and liberals disagree about whether that should be pushed further. The final principle is, I, I got in a little trouble for using this phrase, but I, I call it the harmony of interests, or we might call it mutual advantage. So liberalism is very much the win-win political tradition. And someone says, look, we can help this group or that group. The liberal says, oh, wait, what if we can help them both? It says, look, we have to have a war. The liberal says, okay, maybe we can find a way to have peace. So in general, the idea here is looking for positive sum gains, looking for ways to people interact in positive ways, and believing that ultimately uh, policy and constitutional structure can resolve or to some degree mitigate differences. Compare Marxism here, right? There's no peace until there's a revolution. And liberals have just flat out 
tended to deny that with a, a small number of exceptions. So liberal political tradition is just a series of theories rooted in those four principles. Um, and I think it's important to be clear how diverse it is, how those principles can be interpreted differently. That it's about political values. It's not telling you how to live your own personal life. It's not about theology at all. So that's what I mean when I talk about liberalism. Now, what's integralism? So integralism is pretty interesting because its proponents often don't define its terms. And in many cases, I think there's a few of the more well-known ones that want to keep things vague. But um, without going into that, let me explain how I define it. So the best integralists, as I'll define it in a moment, are the counter-reformation theologians, particularly Francisco Suarez and Cardinal Robert Bellman. And I go with Bellman and Suarez's formulations because those are the richest and most philosophically deep period of anyone who advocates this position. And I take their position to be this. To be an integralist is to hold the following three positions about the ideal circumstances, the ideal political circumstances as Christianity understands them post-fall. Mm -hmm. So we're saying, okay, given the fall, what is our political ideal? What are the principles that should govern our political ideal, our ultimate political aspirations, which have to be chastened by the fact of sin? So here are the principles. The first two are things that Christians uh, can agree on. It's the third one that third one causes some issues. Principle one, so sort of principle of natural authority. God has ordained the state to govern in favor of the common good of the political community. Common good might include certain kinds of rights. It might not. It's usually contrasted with an aggregate, uh, like a utilitarian aggregate of, of the good. Um, it's a kind of indivisible good, a good of the whole, but it includes individual good. And this is taken from scripture and tradition and, and Greek philosophy and all kinds of things. That means integralism is not a theocratic doctrine where clerics rule in all respect. Bellman's very clear. He says, look, God gives infidel kings authority, and the Pope can't depose them, no matter what they do, unless they're persecuting Christians. So ecclesiastical authority has no authority in most matters of you know, politics. Okay. okay. So now we go to the second principle, supernatural authority. God has ordained the church to promote what we might call the supernatural or eternal common good, which is corporate salvation. And the king is not in charge of the church. The church can preach its own doctrine. The church can appoint its own bishops or what have you. In the 16th, 17th centuries, we we're following up on a longer dispute about particularly who can appoint bishops. And there had been a great deal of fighting about whether kings and emperors could do it or whether only popes could do it. In the West, ultimately, it came down to popes being able to do it or be, when they were uh, actually able to. But this idea with integralism is this phrase, duo sunt. Okay, there are two. Now, a lot of Christians can accept those two. I think if most Christians have to accept the second condition. And notice that the first condition is compatible with democracy. And you could have God ordained a democracy. But in the church, if it's Catholic integralism, it's understood as sort of what I would call papal centralism relative to other right. traditions. Okay, so that's fixed. So God fixes the structure of ecclesiastical hierarchy, but does not necessarily fix the hierarchical structure of the state. Now, the third condition is what Bellerman called the indirect power of the Pope, and I call it the indirect supernatural sovereignty condition. Let me give the rationale for it before I can define it. So you've got these two powers, and God has set them over these two domains, the natural and the supernatural. But of course, you can't tightly separate them, right? Mm -hmm. And the thought that Bellerman and many, many, many other Catholic theologians had before and after him was that, well, look, the Church has a nobler mission, right? It's good to eternal. And sometimes the temporal will bear on the eternal. Like, for instance, if the king allows heretical books to spread, let's say, or allows people to apostatize, or allows grave sin. And so in those matters, in those matters alone, the Pope has a kind of indirect sovereignty over the state and the college of bishops, broadly, uh, depending on how you think about their relationship. And what that is to say is that insofar as the king or elected rulers covering matters that affect the church directly, the church can intervene. And the church can direct the state, if it is a Christian state, to help support its spiritual policies. So, for instance, this would involve, say, telling the king, look, use your coercive power to, say, remove Calvin's institutes from the realm. So, I mean, and that's a, that was a thing. That's really the idea, that where the natural bears on the supernatural directly, the church has this sort of indirect power. They can recruit the state to serve as what was oftentimes called their secular arm. Not secular as in unbelieving. Right? So there's a lot of variation in the three conditions. We've got natural authority, supernatural authority, and then the indirect power, the indirect supernatural sovereignty of the church. Now, most Catholics today, Catholic theologians, will accept the first two conditions. And they'll say, well, look, even if the church is superior, that doesn't mean it's sovereign in any sense of the state. 
except to the man its own liberties. But for most of Catholic Church's history, when these questions started to be worked out in the Middle Ages, starting in the early Middle Ages, but really going on down through them entirely, was that the Pope was often in a position to exercise the indirect power. And it right. came up. And in fact, sometimes people thought there was a rationale for this that wasn't just philosophical. Some There was for a time the belief that Constantine had actually donated his diadem to Pope Sylvester, hearing he was of uh, leprosy. And so this was called the Donation of Constantine. It's how popes claim the authority to bestow the title of Roman Emperor or to revoke it at will. So there's different rationales given, but Bellarmine's rationale is the most sensible, which is, you know, look, God's ordained two institutions to tend to the good of the community. And, you know, the state's going to screw stuff up. You might have a heretical king. And there has to be some, the church has to have some recourse because it's, it's good, it's nobler. It can't just sit idly by. It can use reason and persuasion, and it should, and it can excommunicate a king, and it should do that first, okay? But if you go back to the Fourth Lateran Council, which is early 13th century, they say that, look, the king can be, a Christian king can be deposed by the Pope because the Pope can release Christian nobles from their obligations to the king. So that's really what indirect supernatural sovereignty consists of. So to be an integral student, to accept the natural authority, supernatural authority, and indirect sovereignty condition. So at this point, like various people are going to be listening. They're probably going to think like, Kevin, like, I mean, religion has been dying out in the West. Like this Catholic integralism, it, it cannot possibly be like a big influence on contemporary politics. It's like, there's just no need to worry about these things. Like, why are you even writing a book about all this? You know, why we should focus about it? So what, like, what would you say to, to, to someone like that? You know, I always lead with that Oxford commissioned this book because they thought it was a sufficiently important and popular topic. There you go. So why would this be? I could tell a long version of the story, a short version. I'll try to keep it short. It was taken to be the case by the Second Vatican Council, by its early 60s, that integralism would be have been set aside. And that was because a lot of people earlier on pushing back against it, saying it didn't fit the modern world, it didn't grapple with pluralism, and so on. I actually think the last integralist pope not governing in an integralist way was Pius X, pontificate into 1913. I don't think there's been an integralist pope since the view as the ideal. I think it was around among the popes for a very long time. So the Second Vatican Council was just seen as setting it aside and making it irrelevant. That was already in many ways practically irrelevant. What well, isn't theologically irrelevant? It was still kind of, for many people, the North Star, right? The thing at which they aimed, the thing that ultimately guided uh, the way they thought about politics is, you know, we want to get there. And that's what political ideals can do even when they're unrealistic. You know, think about the distance between how far away Marxism seemed until some Marxist parties actually took over. So ideals can really matter. But what's significant about this is why was there the recent supply of integralism and why was there the demand for it after Vatican II had seemingly set it aside for good with Dignitatis Humanae at State and Monarchy? Okay, so I'll do the supply part and the demand. So the supply came from the fact, you know, there were people aware that there was this earlier teaching about religious liberty where it could be restricted in certain cases that Dignitatis Humanae rejected. And many of those people were like, the council screwed up. And so a lot of them were involved or helped form SSPX, Society of St. Pius X. I get in a little trouble when I say they were schismatic, but basically they were an extreme minority of people, and they were extremely antagonistic to church hierarchy, the church hierarchy in effect. And so there are a number of people in the 2000s who thought, well, there is this inconsistency in teaching or seeming inconsistency and discontinuity, but we don't want to be oppositional to the church hierarchy. That's impious. And so they were kind of looking, okay, well, is there some way to reconcile this? So in the early 2000s, and, and particularly in the late 2000s, Thomas Pink is emeritus right now at King's College on and a philosopher and one of the great scholars of the Counter-Reformation. Came up with a new interpretation, Big Thomas Humanae, which allowed for integralism as an ideal and allowed people to read Dignitatis Humanae as it was a policy change, that the church wasn't going to engage in certain kinds of religious coercion, but that it could again if it liked. Now, I can get into all the details there, I won't. So what happened was, it was suddenly on the table, because there was this very, very talented philosopher and theologian arguing for consistency. The vast majority of Catholic theologians still reject it, but it allowed young people to think that they could both be Catholics in good standing with the church, and they could oppose liberalism root and brain. So that was the supply. Now, why was there any demand? No one expected it to go anywhere, not even pay. So shifting over to the demand, why did anyone want to adopt this view? Here's my, my view. Catholics, particularly in the United States, where it's the most popular, had spent a great deal of time trying to be accepted by American society. And there was always a debate within Catholicism about how much one could sort of compromise with America and its principles. And there were Catholics all over the map on that question. 
Some saw no tension, some saw an irrevocable tension, some thought it had to be navigated. Um, but Catholics ultimately did come to become more and more accepted to the point where Catholic intellectuals basically are the chief group of intellectuals influential on the American right. But of course, we also have a, a Catholic president until recently had a Catholic speaker of the House. And so Catholics are actually doing quite well in terms of being accepted. But younger intellectual Catholics are having a very different experience post Obergefell and the LGBT movement. They're on college campuses, and now all of a sudden, they're quote-unquote second-class citizens. They're disliked or suspicious of because of they believe what the church has sort of taught on these issues. And so I think there's a new, younger generation of Catholics that have thought, look, this whole thing about America, our country tolerating us, bringing us in, integrating us, this isn't true. All our institutions are collapsing, our culture is collapsing, we're being pushed around by the quote, woke or whatnot. And so you have the thousands of young Catholics and very, very smart ones saying, you know, maybe there was no reconciliation with America. Maybe we can read recent church teachings more in line with the past where the church was more true to itself and confident. So that's, sorry, the longer answer, why there was the supply, pink, and why there was the demand, the culture war. Right. And I want to come back to the Catholic youth in a bit. But before that, I've got another question. So one of the things that we're seeing across the U.S. and then in various European countries right now, there's a revival of like conservative and more right-wing politics in certain circles. So like in your book, you claim that like, Catholic integralism, it's different from these traditional right-wing political movements. So maybe you could explain the difference for my audience here. Like how are integralists wanting to reorganize society versus how more traditional right-wing politics, like how they want to mm -hmm. organize society? A lot of it actually goes down, knowing who your listeners are, to political epistemology, which is what do we think we can know about what the best society would be? And the traditional conservative says we don't know. We're not in a position to tell that, right? That you can't just formulate an abstract ideal and then say we should go for that. Like that's right. is anathema to traditional conservatism as, as one could be. And integralists just being a kind of, sort of new right phenomenon and say, well, that's a way of just ratifying whatever the left does, but with a 50 year delay. We need a, an ideal to kind of anchor us. And this conservatives would be like, look, we know certain universal moral truths, but we're not going to be able to sort of systematize those, to reorganize the law and society in general. So the biggest difference I have found is in a political epistemology, is that strictly speaking, integralists are not conservatives, they're counter-revolutionaries. So instead of, say, being Edmund Burke on the French Revolution, who your uh, listeners may know a little bit about, it's Joseph de Maistre, who was the French counter-revolutionary hoping to restore throne and altar. So it's fundamentally not conservatism, and they, even, they understand this. Now, in some Catholic countries, there may be some continuities, but there's so much internal change in the church, this really is a counter-revolutionary doctrine, if you want to go to it. And there are a number of integrals to do, and others who kind of think this is more like an abstract theological debate, that they very much want to win. So that's a very, very big difference, but there's a number of other differences that are interesting. For instance, integrals tend to be more economically left-wing. They tend to be about as socially conservative as one could be. There's no kind of like moderately socially conservative. So they want to, you know, say, ban pornography entirely ban gay marriage entirely. Many of them want to sort of restore the enforcement of sodomy laws, blasphemy laws, blue laws, ban abortion completely in every circumstance with the exception of like the life of a mother. So yeah, I mean, they're as socially conservative as they could be, but they're kind of more economically progressive in various respects. So those are some other interesting differences. Yeah. And when you lay them out like that, the differences are quite stark. So I want to come back to the youth though. Because there's something I've noticed since I started doing this podcast and since I started entering the bizarre world of YouTube. There's like this odd interest, like you pointed out, of integralism among younger conservatives. And when I first started doing all these YouTube and podcast interviews, people would ask me what I thought about integralism, but I had no idea what they were talking about. Because I, I had been outside of the US for so long, I was like, I don't, is this some new like American thing? I don't know what you're talking about. And so I had to look it up. And then when I started reading a bit about it, I was like, why are they, why are the youth interested in this? This makes no sense to me. So like, what do you think's going on here? Like, why do you think there's all these new younger people so attracted to Catholic integralism? So, you know, I have a pretty detailed opinion on this too, but again, I'll, I'll try to sum it up. So one thing about sort of young political minds is that when they grasp certain principles, they want to go for it. And it isn't really tempered a lot of times by experience. This is one of the reasons that you see young people being radicals and older people kind of mellowing out as they have more experience. They're not so impressed with the sort of insight that one feels when one grasps political truths or political principles. And that radicalism manifests in different ways in different parts of politics in different countries. On the right, say 30 years ago, that was libertarianism, um, political libertarianism. So the way to be radical, the way to get your very simple principles, 
wants to be a libertarian. But the thing is, libertarians are overwhelmingly atheist. And from Ayn Rand's influence early on, I mean, Ayn Rand was a new atheist before there were new atheists. I mean, she, the way she talks about religion is just like identical, pretty much, to the way a lot of new atheists talk, with a couple of exceptions. And so, you know, I've been involved in sort of libertarian stuff for about, I guess, 22 years now. And so even when I started, even though I had no sympathies with Rand whatsoever and became a theist a few years into it, mm -hmm. the hostility to religion was very intense. But one of the things that happened, and I think in part because of the downstream cultural effects of analytic theism, analytic theistic philosophy of religion, was that if you really dug into it, you watched the YouTube channels and stuff, you realized that the theists actually were not stupid, that they weren't sort of intellectually blow, that they weren't more intellectually dishonest, that they were actually went to debate sometimes. And so I think younger people kind of felt, oh, wow, so I'm not just going to become like a devotee of the market. I can adopt this like broader doctrine that covers like my whole life. Because libertarians, you know, just said, look, we're not right. going to tell you anything about how to live, right? And I think a lot of younger people said, okay, look, I'm not an idiot if I'm a Christian. And this doctrine, particularly Catholicism, is going to give me answers to all of life questions. And it's also, I can be a really right. sort of fun, radical version of this. And it allows me to oppose in every way what these university professors and people in my social circles and work and stuff oppose. So I think it's kind of all those things came together. And what a lot of libertarians don't understand, because they don't understand theology at all, is why they're libertarians who've converted. A lot of the integrals, mm. younger people I know, are former libertarians. And so that's another reason I think it's a shift of a desire for radicalism, a radicalism liking, if you will, that just changes up. Because I think Catholic integralism can do a lot of stuff for people that libertarianism can't do, is it can speak to all of life. Interestingly enough, this was something Rand had a problem with libertarians about. She said they're right-wing hippies. You need a whole conference of doctrine. Rand invented right. one, and almost no one adopted it. Yeah. And almost everybody finds it repugnant when they hear it. Yeah, so you've got this... Because, I mean, I, I had a libertarian phase as well uh, when I was younger. And, yeah, you're right. It's, there's, it's not a worldview. There's, there's, there's nothing there. Whereas something like Christian theology, or, or Catholic theology in particular, that is a well-developed worldview that's supposed to give you like details of everything so i can see yep. why yeah screw the establishment yep. you know i've got that attitude already and i've got these kind of libertarian leanings and then now i've got this worldview yep. that can tell me everything well well i've, I've got i've got all the answers to yep. all of life you know yeah i can i can see this <laughs> yeah mm -hmm, right so, yeah, and maybe now there's that. eternal life i'm set for all of eternity yeah, yeah. This is, yeah. no, no, no. It makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Uh, so the next thing I want to talk about, though, is so in your book, you mention some of the integralist critiques of traditional liberalism, because this is some of the stuff, too, that I think will probably capture people's yeah. imaginations, like why they would want to go towards this thing. So for the sake of the audience, though, helping us out here to better understand integralism, maybe if you could just briefly discuss some of the standard critiques that these integralists have of traditional liberalism. Yeah, just briefly point about the book. The book is in many ways a deep dive into integral because the integralists beat spend about a hundred times more talking about liberalism than talking about their own view. And so I've defended publicly liberalism in a variety of venues. But nonetheless, so I don't want people to go into the book, say, thinking they're going to get this big defense of liberalism. I try to do that yeah. in other places and eventually I'll have more to say. I just thought integralism deserved analysis. Right, because like earlier you had mentioned, they're usually really vague, so they're critiquing the liberals yes. all day long, and they're like, well, what am I view? I'm not telling you. So Yeah, right. So they accept basically every critique of liberalism that there is, so it's hard to go through them mm -hmm. all. Like, I think the anti-liberalism, in some cases, leads, and then the critiques follow. But let's be fairer than mm -hmm. that. So what are two of them? One is the sense that liberalism is too individualistic, and then in the sense that liberalism claims... The liberal governments can be neutral between conceptions of the good life when in fact they're not and in fact they're disingenuous about this fact so one is just the individualism look there's this individual liberty and people don't have unchosen obligations though even lock off their unchosen obligations like it's not really true of liberalism that they think there's unchosen obligations um that everything's just a matter of consent nonetheless this is what a lot of the integralists say they say it's atomistic it destroys community that's a very common criticism that, that is given and I do think there are some ways in which liberalism tends to dissolve certain kinds of associations, although I think it helps others. One of the big ones is you've got this atomistic individualism. So it's very common. But actually, the one that they talk more about is this idea of liberal neutrality. So you remember when I said early on that one of the sort of pivotal principles of liberalism is a commitment to toleration. And the thought here is that we want to tolerate different religious perspectives. And that means, for instance, the federal government should not take a position on the divinity of Christ. It shouldn't take even a position, say, on whether God exists, many liberals will say. 
Whereas, you know, 50 years ago, they say, well, nature's God, that's fine. We'll put in God, we trust on coins or what have you, because that happens much later after the founding. But, um, and that's neutral enough. But I mean, now liberals will say, yeah, even that isn't properly tolerant. And so the question became, as the toleration began to be expanded to moral affairs, questions about, for instance, same-sex uh, couples, the liberals said, look, let's have the state be neutral in that. To some degree, everyone can be married, you know, or what have you. Um, there started to be these questions that were like, well, that's not really neutral between worldviews, because some of us think that same-sex marriage is not a thing. Mm-hmm. And abortion is like, we're supposed to be neutral between pro-life and pro-choice, but it's not even clear how that would go in principle. Over and over again, it's like, once the liberals get into power, they do these things that are flagrantly non-neutral, despite telling us all they care about is wanting to live and let live when they're out of it. And they say they're going to tolerate everybody, but when it comes to tolerating traditional people of faith, it's like, no, you're bigots. And one of the really big ways this came up was with the religious exemptions and the Little Sisters of the Poor case, where, and this is, it's actually, the Little Sisters of the Poor court case is actually way more complicated than people think, and I can't go into all the details, but the thought was basically the way it came up publicly was that the Obama administration was trying to force nuns to pay for contraception in the name of equality. And the thought was like, no, no, you're supposed to tolerate all religion. You're not tolerating Catholics. Now, there was an exemption for certain groups. It should have been applied to the Little Sisters. It has been. It turns out the details of how they insured was complicated. But leaving all that aside, the thought was bit by bit, oh, look, Obama's a liberal, but he's going after these nuns. Leave them alone. Like, why are you doing this? Like, if you were really neutral, you would leave them alone. And then when it became sort of gradually like, okay, what is, you know, the trans issue comes up. And the thought is, look, if you're not on board with the trans issue, you're, it, we're not just tolerating a variety of opinions there. It's like there's good people who are pro-trans and there's bad people who are anti-trans. And so the, what I think a lot of people are picking up on, although this is what I think, I actually think the left and the right have become less liberal. And I think their illiberalism builds on one another. And they're in a vicious cycle. And they keep upping the ante in terms of the way they're going to stop each other. And this, you're seeing a lot of this on the right and the popular conversation. So in essence, the idea was to experience and then reflection that liberalism was not and could not be neutral between different conceptions of the good. In the end, liberalism is itself a comprehensive doctrine. It does answer questions about how to live, whether it does so explicitly or not. And so the only interesting decision in politics is not whether to tolerate or not. It's what is true and what is false. And so if there's a true comprehensive doctrine, we should have that. If there's a false one, we should not have that. There is no neutrality between the true and the false. This is a constant refrain among integralists and in broader post-liberal thought. And you also see it on the left with liberals kind of, on that case, it's sort of like liberals are too conservative, they're too reformist, they're not revolutionary enough, they need to go for equality, doesn't matter what the religious people think, you know, they're all, they're bigots anyway, they're as bad as racists. Liberalism is getting kind of from both sides, but that's, I think, what you're hearing a lot about, that liberalism is not and cannot be neutral. So it makes sense. So I want to make sure I'm following this properly. So I look at liberalism. I'm like, okay, you guys tell me you really care about tolerance. You you talk a big game about it. But now I just look at any given political leader who is supposed to be part of a liberal society, and they're not being tolerant in the slightest. So it doesn't matter if they're on the left or the right, but they're politicians in the liberal society. They're not doing what they're saying they're doing. And so this is a big part of the critique. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, that makes sense to me because I feel like I could see that every time I would come back to America after being gone for a while, I would just see this bigger division and just less and less tolerance for anybody who just slightly disagrees, just hitting me from all sides. And so I'm like, ooh. So I can see why you might want to look somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But but here's the thing, though. Like when I look at some of these Catholic integralists online, I typically find myself feeling quite uncomfortable. And and it's like the words Mm -hmm. that come to mind are things like authoritarian. And then sometimes even the word like violence will come to mind when I'm looking at some of these things. So do you think there's like a violent streak in some of these thinkers so given that they're Catholic, I know they're going to immediately say, no, 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 we like deny violence. You know, like there shouldn't be anything like that. We care about peace. But I still can't shake the worry of the violence here because I know too much about the history of the Catholic Church and Western history to be able to just say, yeah, sure. You say no violence, but come on. So I want to know, like, what, what do you think about this? Do you think that these Catholic integralists, like, do you think that Catholic integralism and violence go hand in hand? So I have to be very careful here Mm -hmm. because I distinguish in the book between what I call theorists and strategists. And the theorists are people like Pink who are basically engaged in an exercise in ideal theory because they want the church to recover its legacy. And they've all told me, look, we're not going for integralism until there's a Catholic revival. Unless, like, almost everyone's Catholic. Like, we can't do this in compatible with Catholic teaching. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't work anyway. 
so like Father Thomas Crean and Alan Pemister, who wrote this book on integralism, I've interviewed them both, and they both say this. And of course, once integralism happens, there is the use of religious coercion. These are folks that would have coercive penalties for recalcitrant heresy, mm. recalcitrant heresy, penalties for uh, sodomy and things like that. So there definitely is this sort of coercive character. Crean and Femistry even say in the ideal polity, non-Catholics wouldn't be able to vote. Although they do say they wouldn't take away voting rights of anyone who currently has them, which is interesting and I think inconsistent. Okay. So that, I think, you know, starts to get pretty problematic. But there's a way in which it's not really, it's not going to make me uncomfortable exactly because what they're trying to do is they're just engaged in an, an ideal political theology. Mm-hmm. That's the project that they're engaged in. They're not actually pushing for any of this stuff. Ah, but they're not the Twitter jet set. Right. Okay. But the Twitter jet set are the American integrals. And these are folks I have very detailed opinions, very strong opinions. And these include Adrian Vermeule, Sarab Amari. Chad Pecknold, Gladden Pappen, and increasingly Patrick Deneen. And then there's a sort of smattering of the second ring of folks, you know, you find on Twitter 10, 15 accounts, people that are fellow travelers and so on. And these are folks who I'm virtually certain, they're not just integralists, they, they're very confident in it. They also think that it will happen mm. and that they can help it along. So it's very much like an inverse Marxism. So you read them a lot. A lot of it's the American integralist writing is about why liberalism will fail why it will collapse. And that much of what they're doing is preparing for the collapse of liberalism by trying to create a better understanding of the alternative to demystify liberalism and to train up younger conservatives who would enter the judiciary and who would enter the administrative state when they're prepared uh, for liberalism to fall. They don't predict the day, but I make a case in the book in chapter four that Vermeule thinks that uh, liberalism has internal contradictions that will lead to its fall that the job of Catholics is to form a kind of community where this is understood. And ultimately, this community will train up a kind of future elite. So this is very much what Deneen is talking about in regime change or replace the elite. So they're trying to create a counter elite that would ultimately co-opt the judiciary and the administrative state in order to try to change the country. Now, I think once Deneen's book came out, it was very clear what was going on. If you look at Vermeule's strategic writings, which aren't all united in one place, so what I do in the book is I work through Vermeule's stuff. But Deneen's come basically to Vermeule's view, but it's a kind of integralism light. But he sends signals in the book. So like the last chapter is called Integration, and it's basically a week, week, nudge, nudge. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now here's what they're going to say when you say, well, what about this violence thing? They're going to say, no, if you can get them to tell you their view, their real view is, no, liberalism is going to do itself in. So we just have to be in the right place at the right time. Okay. But of course, they have no idea whether liberalism is going to right. fall or not, because their their model of this is pitifully simple. And I go through the model of, of why liberalism will fall and just, just show that it's got so many problems. For instance, it, they have only one causal dynamic in the model, liberalism and the things that liberalism does. There's no model of like other ideologies in the system. There's no consideration of how like dissenting groups inside the state or outside the state will function. And so I just go through all mm-hmm. And so what I say is, I say, look, integralism fundamentally is what I call morally infeasible. And it's a dilemma because either integralism is feasible, but immoral because it requires violence or it's moral, but it's infeasible because you can't get there. So, so to get to integralism, many large pluralistic society, you've got to break some eggs. So for instance, I bring up in the book and I expect this to be controversial. I say, look, if it's a country like the United States, okay, you're going to have a large black Protestant community. Mm-hmm. You're going to have a large LGBT community, and you're going to have a lot of just plain old secular people, and you're going to have a large or sizable or reasonably sized Jewish community, and none of these folks are going down without a fight. Right. And so when you just start to imagine what would be required, there's no way around it but for them to use violence. They're going to have to use violence against Protestants. They're going to have to use violence against Jews. They're going to have to use violence against atheists. There's no way around it. But... What I'm telling you is the theorists will be like, no, 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 no. Like, we're hundreds of years away from being able to do this because we have to have Catholic society. Mm-hmm. The strategists will be like, no, 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 Liberalism is going to do itself in. We're not, we're just going to sweep in after liberalism falls. But because it won't fall, they're going to have to make it fall. And the only way to make it fall is to hurt people. Right. So that's my view. Yeah, that's, and see, these are the things that make me very uncomfortable. Now, yeah, me too. But I think it's very important to be clear about, these distinctions. about what they would say, yeah. but your intuition, the feeling that you're getting is picking up on something real, even though integrals do have responses. To. Sure. Yeah. That's, it's important to have that nuance there. Now, now listening to everything you're saying and then reading through the book, one's going to get the impression that Catholic integralism actually contradicts 
like the basic Catholic moral teachings. Like maybe you could expand a bit on that. Yeah, yeah. It's actually kind of complicated because, you know, in chapter two, I make the case that some of these medieval conciliar documents actually may fit with integralism a little bit better than the contemporary stuff. So the integrals argue, for instance, that Pius, uh, Pope Pius IX's Pontecura and the, its appendix, the syllabus of errors, actually fits with them more than the contemporary church. So just laying that on the table. There's a couple of ways in which I think it conflicts with dogma. One, you want any good I- political ideal, any good political ideal that worth its salt isn't just a theory of the ideal. It also gives you some sense of how to approach it. Right? Ideals beckon. And so a, an ideal is very weak if you say, well, I have no idea how to get to it, but it's the ideal. Then the conservative critique starts to slip in. So if it's part of integralism that there's a transition strategy, and you might deny that, then it violates Catholic teaching because you have to violate Catholic moral teaching on violence, war, and so on in order to get to integralism. In particular, there's, I think, any complex, diverse society where you have complex institutions that interact in complex ways, there are many cases where you're going to have to make things worse to make things better. And it's just not clear from Catholic moral theology that that's something you can do. You can't deliberately reduce the good to increase it. Yeah. But getting to any ideal in a complex society where there's feedback effects, there's unpredictability, I think it's going to require making things worse before they get better. And that Vermeule and the others are simply fooling themselves or, you know, that liberalism will make things worse and that we will make it better. So that's the first reason. If you think an ideal has to be plausible, has to have some kind of transitional option. You might shear the ideal entirely from anything transitional and just say, look, we're just doing pure this, the purest of the pure ideal theory. No idea how to approach it. Have no idea whether we can. Would it contradict Catholic teaching in that respect? Well, there's one way in which I think that it would, but it takes a little bit of explanation because it has to do with the theology of baptism. Okay. okay. So traditionally in Roman Catholic political thought in the Middle Ages, when you're baptized, like everyone was in Catholic nations, you also become a member of the church, and the church is itself a nobler polity. And that means you're subject to all the rights and responsibilities thereof. And those include, when you grow up, the responsibility to not leave the church, and the responsibility to not stubbornly teach right. against the church on matters of faith and faith. So, essentially, if you grow up in a church-authorized state, you can then be subject to certain kinds of coercion as a result of state coercion as a result of the mere fact that you were baptized. That might be the medieval teaching. And I see maybe maybe the integralists are right that it is. Another teaching, which is uh, much more universal across Catholic social thought, that goes back at least to the Fourth Council of Toledo in the 8th century, and certainly down to the present day, which is that you can't force people to be baptized. You, you just can't force baptism. It's just an affront to human dignity. So... I think there's going to be a tension between the idea that you can't use religious coercion against the unbaptized, but you can against the baptized. Because even if you accept everything the Catholics say about baptism, the idea that it's a moral transformer, that it turns religious coercion from unjust to just, just doesn't work. There's no way to explain why religious coercion of the unbaptized is wrong that doesn't already carry through to the baptized. So imagine the following case. I don't have this in the book because it's kind of an absurd case, but imagine that there's a nurse who's in the maternity ward, and every baby she helps deliver, she baptizes them in secret before she gives them back to her parents, right? Now, if she lives in a church-authorized state, she's breaking the law, right? You, you can't violate family that way. But the baptism, despite being illicit, would be valid. And so you'd have all of these people, thousands of people, growing up with a liability, a criminal liability, to heresy and apostasy, even though they had no idea, no way of knowing that they were baptized. Now, of course, they wouldn't be justifiably tried and convicted because they wouldn't have the relevant culpability, right? But the very idea that baptism alone would be, oh, yeah, yeah, well, we could prosecute them for heresy now if they're guilty. Before, of course, we could not. They could teach the exact same thing. They could live exactly the same lives. The only difference is whether the nurse baptized right. them or not. And that changes religious coercion from illicit right. to illicit. And I think there's no, since there's no way to square that circle, and I go through like five different ways of doing it in the book, integralist ideal will conflict with the Catholic teaching against religious coercion which is absolute, was reaffirmed the Second Vatican Council, and there's really no exception to. There are some questions about what happens post-baptism, but the Church is always opposed to first course baptism. So I think ultimately integralism is going to be inconsistent with that. Yeah. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. Now, something you've kind of touched on a little bit here is, is another thing I wanted to talk about your book. So you say that Catholic integralism is a poor guide to social reform. So tell me a bit about this. Like, why is this going to be a poor guide to social reform? Mm-hmm. 
So this gets into some of the ideal theory literature and analytic mm-hmm. political philosophy, and I'll try to do it without jargon. It's typically thought that ideals shouldn't just be a, have a transitional plan, but they should be in some sense right. action guiding. They should tell us something about how to say rank different states of affairs as better and worse. And in one respect, it does in a very simple way, which is that has your society constitutionalized the indirect power? So in that sense, it's like, yeah, do this thing. But the difficulty is that it really doesn't do anything beyond that because there's no way in a large and complex society that it tells you about any of the transitional stages. Now, if you want to know about the transitional principles, those aren't unique to integralism at all and may not lead to integralism if you follow them. So let's go through what Russ Pittenger says the four principles of Catholic social thought are. Okay, so there's the dignity of the person, which the integrals don't really like to talk about all that much, the common good, which they'd love to talk about all the time, solidarity, which they don't do as much with because it's it's seen as a lefty thing, and the subsidiarity, which is this decentral stuff that they have to reinterpret because the American integrals are such fans of the central state. So you've got subsidiarity, solidarity, you've got common good and dignity, so you've got four different principles that are supposed to be action guiding immediately in ordinary political life. And you've got to weigh them against each other and look at trade-offs and so on. And that means as you transition to the adjacent possible, right, the nearby worlds, and you use those Catholic principles, you could end up with all kinds of different states of affairs and never get any closer to the ideal and you might even get further from it. So the idea is that what integralism does is it tells you this very abstract thing, but doesn't really tell you anything about how to right. approach it. Because there's nothing unique about integralism with respect to these more fundamental principles. So that's why I think it's not an action-guiding ideal, because the, the principles on which it justifies itself can just lead to reforms that go in lots and lots of different directions. You know, maybe you make the welfare state larger, then people feel a little less, you know, need to be religious, and so maybe they secularize a little bit or something. There's just a thousand different ways that it can go. Now, the response to me is going to be like, well, doesn't that apply to all ideals? Like, aren't most ideals not actually guiding? To which my response is, <laughs> yes. Because I'm more a yeah, non-ideal yeah. theory guy. So, I yeah. Mean, so, I mean, for me, like, one of the things I want from a society is I want it to be, like, relatively stable. Because, I mean, I've had to jump from postdoc yeah. to postdoc my entire adult life. Like, I've never had any stability in my job situation. And so for the past 12 years, I've mainly lived outside of the U.S. And then, like, every time I come back or work in the U.S. for a limited amount of time, I just get the sense that American society is no longer stable. And then now that I'm living here, like, full time in the U.S., again, like, it feels increasingly unstable. But these Catholic integralists yeah. are going to be like, Ryan, like, we can give you a stable society. We can give you it all. Yeah. But, but you're just going to say no. Like, you don't think they can make good on that promise. Like, like why? Uh-huh. So this is in some ways the, the richest chapter and the hardest chapter of the book. And I felt like I had to write it in a pretty rich way because I think it's the most interesting and sophisticated, complex plan they make. Because they're not interested in any stability at all. They don't want a modus vivendi. They're very, very plain that they want stability to be based on people's grasp and compliance Mm -hmm. with the natural law. And the reason that they think their society will be stable is because sin pollutes our knowledge of and capacity to follow the natural law. And if you've constitutionalized the indirect power, the church will be in a special position to grace the state so that people have a better knowledge of the moral law as the natural law. And they'll have more virtue in order to achieve it. So the ultimate argument for stability is not that things just won't collapse. It's that there'll be a kind of moral stability. Stability proceeds from the moral capacities of the Christian. So that's the claim. Um, but they also say because it's more compatible with our nature, we're going to get more stability. That's when, why they talk about order all the time. But you really have to work to get clear on the kind of stability claim they're making. Because the Egyptian pharaohs were yeah. extremely stable. It lasted it's a really, really long yeah. time. But that's yeah. not what they want. Yeah. But that's not what they want. So it's moral stability. Stability, I mean, we're all called stability for the right reasons, but actually the concept I think they have is a little different. So um, there are a bunch of problems that I talk about. The one I don't talk about much in the book because it would have made the model of stability I developed much more complicated is the relationship between the Vatican and whatever integralist country there is and their power. So the reason I think integralism ever became a thing in practice was because it was during a period of time where Western nation states were sufficiently weak that they couldn't ignore the church or sufficiently strong to where they were were useful to the church. There's an economist, Mark Koyama, in his book, Religion and Toleration, who talks about this model of economic history. And Mark helped me some with the book, and we talked a lot about this. Basically, it has to be the case that the interests of the papacy, the interests of the state are aligned, and their levels of power and influence are relatively similar. 
Because unlike other ideals, you have these two powers, right? And so even you're so pointing out, it's like, look, we never knew who to follow. So suppose the Pope deposes a king, but you think the Pope's in error about that. Depositions right. aren't infallible. There's also the problem of the interdict. So the way that oftentimes Popes would destabilize monarchies is by denying everyone in it the sacrament, which I just think is unfathomably cruel. Little old lady who can't change politics and right. she can't the Eucharist anymore. And so then the thought was like, well, interdicts aren't infallible either. And so you have all of these kind of mixed messages. And so what happens in the medieval period is the period of like integralist relations between, say, the French monarchy and the Pope lasted about 35 years between when it's arguably established under St. Louis and when it's destroyed by Philip IV's conflict with Pope Boniface VIII. And so the idea is that one off problem of stability is that you're just rarely going to be in a position where the power levels and influence levels and the common interests of these two powers are aligned. What's worse is if you have monarchy, you're going to have the instabilities that come from monarchy, which is succession crises. And if you have democracy, you're going to have more leadership rotation and different priorities. And you're going to have a competitive party system that encourages people to disagree. And so whether you have monarchy or democracy is going to create a lot of stability problems just all on its own, but also for cooperating with the Pope. And this is why no Pope has ever tried or even bothered with trying to depose a democratic leader. Um, it's just been monarch. So that's another thing. You have to consider how things interact between the interests of the papacy and then the constitutional structure of the main society. Yeah. So that's just one problem, one stability problem that I think is very severe and very obvious. What happens is monarchs will start to interfere with oh, yeah. the papal conclave, such that for many centuries, there were various Catholic monarchs who actually could veto yeah. papal candidate. Nobody, no integralist wants that. But it creates an incentive for the monarchs to get involved in church governance. And that's not the kind of stability no. they want either. So that would be a disaster, and it happened a lot. So that's another stability problem. But here's the weirdest one, and the one that I think is really, really interesting and really problematic if you isolate for papal politics, which is that integralism makes baptism expensive because it gives, when parents baptize their children, it gives them legal liabilities. Now, in a French integral society where nobody knew any theology, no one understood, you know, people don't really know anything, everyone got baptized as an automatic thing, nobody really thought about it. You know, okay, they're not really thinking about the fact that, oh, if I if my kid gets baptized, he's going to be liable for heresy and apostasy, depending on what kind of person he's raised to be. But in any future integral society, there's going to be at least enough communication to where people are going to know what's different. They're going to know that the church was against this for 100 years, okay, yeah. at least. Their integralism is not dogma, and denying it's always going to be on the table. And so people are going to say, well, why if I have a public baptism that's on record with the state, why would I do this? Why not, like slightly alter the baptismal rite, or in particular, lie to the state about whether I had a baptism, or do the baptism entirely in secret, right? And so what's going to gradually happen is that this, the portion of the citizenry over which the church has authority, so remember, it doesn't have any authority over the baptized, or <laughs> the secretly baptized, and won't have effective authority over them, the incentive for the church, the power of the church over its citizenry is going to shrink as more and more people are like, hey, they had their kid baptized in secret. My kid, they know is baptized. And so, uh-oh, he's growing up and he's wanting to be Protestant, mm -hmm. right? Well, I mean, what parent is going to be like, well, you know, the church doesn't like a secret baptism, but it's valid. And my kid doesn't get drawn up on, on apostasy charge if they change their mind. Okay, yeah, I'm going to go that way. So, so essentially, integralism is discouraging yeah. baptism. <laughs> and that's a problem, internal problem for the view, so that the ability of the church to stabilize society will shrink as its influence over the portion of citizens shrinks. And so I think actually even if you isolate for the state, there's an internal destabilizing element. Because again, integralism makes right. Because yeah, you've got, you've got this deep incentive to go, if I want some basic liberties or just some protections, I'm not going to get baptized, or at least not publicly. Yes. Yeah, or baptize my children. Man, yeah, yeah, no, that that's terrible. That's part of the crucial crux of your society, and you're like, let's let's put all this underground. Yeah, this is a, it's a serious problem. Yeah. So I want to look at one final critique that you give of Catholic integralism. So like after living in the UK and Europe, and then learning about the ways that church and state have been entangled, like I had this kind of newfound appreciation for a separation of church and state. And I also have a newfound appreciation for religious liberty. And even more so now that I'm teaching for this master's program at Lucerne, because it's about Jewish, Christian, Islamic philosophy all coming together. But you claim, though, that Catholic integralism has a contradictory view of religious liberty. So explain that to me. Yeah. So I already kind of did because of this business about the religious liberty of the baptized and the unbaptized. And so the inconsistency is that the religious liberty for the baptized, the way they interpret Dignitatis Humanae, 
as only applying to the liberties of the unbaptized or the liberties of the baptized in a non-Christian state, they're extensive. There's freedom of speech, there's freedom of the press, there's family freedoms, educational freedoms on, and you can start your own schools, you can print your own documents over, over, and over and over again. So in an integral society, remember, unbaptized Jews, we could talk about baptized Jews, mm-hmm. it could, but that gets real likely real fast because of the history. Because you could forcibly baptize a Jewish child mm-hmm. and then what is the integral state? Gosh. So let's just assume like unbaptized Jewish populations, Muslim populations, as long as they're theists, and because the integralists think that all atheism is irrational, as long as they're theists and their practices don't violate natural law. So like you could ban Muslim polygamy, but you can't ban other stuff. You know, you have to leave them alone. Okay. They have to have religious liberty because that's part of not forcing them to be members of the state. Yeah. And the church authorized state, the church. But once you're baptized, the mere fact that you're baptized subjects you to potentially really severe religious coercion. And so what I call this is the baptism dilemma in the book. And it's the question of whether baptism is a moral transform, that it transforms religious coercion by the state from unjust, absolutely unjust, to just. And so that's the contradiction. So I say, okay, look, there's a bunch of different ways to try to resolve it. Aquinas had a way where he says that baptism involves a vow. So a vow is something you can't force on someone, but that once it's made, it can be enforced. But the problem is Aquinas is not part of the Summa. He isn't okay. talking about the baptism of infants. And so he doesn't say that. So it, it might make sense if you're baptized right. as an adult, like if you know what you're getting into, right? But it, the infant's not making any vow. So Erasmus centuries later is like, look, let's make sure we don't force people into the church. So let's ask people when they come of age whether they agree with the baptismal obligations their godparents acquired upon their baptism. He's immediately condemned by the Parisian School of Theology. Council of Trent raised part of their censure to a canon in the Council of Trent that may, Pink argues, is, is dogma, is irreformable, where they said, no, 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 you don't have to, to ask them. Baptism alone is sufficient to make religious coercion licit. So the idea is baptism alone, so it's going to apply to infants. So you can't take Aquinas' response, you can't say infants are making a vow. So what you have to do is you have to say, well, it's the godparents' vow that binds the baptized infant to the canon law and the state backing of the, the canon law. There's a bunch of problems. Suppose that you have an infant baptism, but they just leave out the godparent vows. Okay. There's no vowing anymore. But baptism still has to transform coercion from unjust to just, even though there's no vow. So then you have to say, well, getting baptized is like life of that. For an adult, you can kind of see it, like you kind of understand it. For an infant, it's not there. So I go through, you know, a bunch of different options for resolving the baptism dilemma, and I just think there's no way to do it. Right. So I've got one final question for you. Do you really think that liberalism, this great scourge that the Catholic integralists really hate, like, do you think it's actually worth saving? And like, what, just like, what's so good about liberalism? So I have so much to say here, and I will say a lot more. My next project's going to be on what Christians mm-hmm. ought to think about liberalism. I've been doing, writing some essays, preparatory essays on this now. Liberalism is what love looks like when we know we're never going to agree. Yeah. yeah. So if you have a society where like everybody's Christian and you say, look, maybe the state can kind of help us out in certain kind of indirect ways, it can nudge us to keep us where we are a little bit. I think that's kind of hard to resist given what's at stake. But once you have a society like the United States, acknowledging, you know, tolerating others, this idea that you don't use religious coercion against non-believers and those who are different with you is a deeply Christian principle that's been part of church history, it's based on the recognition of our natural freedom, our free will, our reason. It's based on a Christian ideal of our natural equality, right? It's based on the Christian ideal of peace, which I think is where we get toleration from. This sort of question about mutual advantage, I'll leave aside. It's kind of complicated. But I think liberalism is what the gospel looks like politically in a diverse society because of these principles of freedom, equality, and peace. And so that's what's worth saving about it, is that I think that it's the only really consistent way to live out the gospel when, say, most people aren't Christians or aren't the same kind. So that's not like a ringing endorsement of liberalism as a set of universal rational principles. I don't really quite think of liberalism that way, but that's really what, what's worth saving about it. Because, it, you know, you start to depart from it. The stuff you have to do to, to really start departing from it, particularly matters of toleration, starts to look like it's a destruction of trust, reconciliation, love, and friendship. And so that's kind of my brief answer. No, yeah, I'm tempted to say amen, but uh, that'd be too charismatic for me. <laughs> uh, but, but either way, Kevin, though, thank you for being on the show today. This has been an absolutely fascinating conversation. Oh, thanks. Yeah. 
And there you have it, another episode of the Reluctant Theologian Podcast. Stay tuned for more episodes on philosophical theology. 